My name is Artemis Kirk, University Librarian, and it's a great pleasure to see so many of you here this evening. Friends, library associates, students, faculty members, and neighbors. We have an exciting program in store for you tonight with esteemed alumni panelists, M. Lindsay Bierman, Mark Poirier, and Christopher Reich. I want to thank the Department of English for co-sponsoring this event with our and our library staff, many of whom have worked extremely hard to put this program together and make this event possible. This is the first Georgetown Writes program. We hope it will become an annual series that will feature Georgetown alumni authors. The panels are going to be an opportunity for our students and maybe our alums to learn what it means to enter a field and the steps that actual writers took to become successful writers. In tonight's program, we're bringing together three very accomplished alumni from a variety of writing professions. I'm happy to announce Mr. M. Lindsay Bierman, who graduated from Georgetown College in 1987. He began his career as a designer, researcher, and writer for Robert A. M. Stern Architects and wrote for architecture and interior design magazines. He then served as editor-in-chief of Southern Living magazine from 2010 to 2014, during which he oversaw the editorial vision and content of the magazine. Mr. Bierman is now, as of August, the chancellor of the University of North Carolina School for the Arts. Mark Poirier, our second speaker, is a 1991 graduate of Georgetown College, and he's published several novels, including Modern Ranch Living, Goats, and two collections of short stories, as well as editing the book, I love this title, The Worst Years of Your Life, Stories for the Geeked Out, Angst-Ridden, Lust-Addled, and Deeply Misunderstood Adolescent in All of Us. <laughs> he wrote the screen adaptation of his novel, Goats, and the screenplays for the films Smart People and Hate Ship, Love Ship. He currently teaches screenwriting at a place on the Charles called Harvard University. <laughs> New York Times best-selling author Christopher Reich graduated from Georgetown School of Foreign Service in 1983. He worked as a stockbroker and then for the Union Bank of Switzerland. He began his writing career when he moved back to Austin, Texas in 1998 with his first novel, Numbered Account. And he's since published nine more books, including his newest novel, The Prince of Risk. I have the pleasure of acting as the sort of convener of this panel discussion. I'm going to ask our authors some questions, but I hope that you too will ask questions of them as well. We have microphones at both sides of the stairs, and if you can navigate, we will have a very exciting evening indeed. So, gentlemen, all of you are Georgetown alumni, welcome back. School has Thank changed, you. as you see. Each of you, however, is a different kind of writer, and each of you has worked in different fields. So now that you work in very different areas in writing, maybe you would speak to the particulars of the areas of writing that you do. I began my career as a ghostwriter, so I had to get inside the head of a world-famous architect who, at the time, had a PBS series and was working on a series of books called New York Architecture, and it had gone through the history of New York architecture and urbanism from the 1880s through to the present. So it was very academic research. I spent days, weeks uh, at Columbia University Library, and it was heavily footnoted. There were probably 5,000 footnotes and 1,000 yeah. pages. Um, but from there, I transitioned into writing for a very mass mainstream consumer, which is entirely different. Um, and for that, uh, I had been well prepared, though, through, um, through going through the rigor of um, essentially fact checking and, very, and maintaining the, the highest journalistic standards uh, through research and, um, and, and really great clarity and precision about, about the subject of architecture. And, and so I was able to apply that learning um, into um, a, a career at Southern Living with a lot in between, but that's sort of the short, the short of it. That's great. Mark. I started uh, as a fiction writer, and um, <coughs> I, I did pretty well. And uh, I, I, I fell into screenwriting because I was sort of 
broke. And um, <laughs> there was a fellowship that a friend of mine told me about called the Chesterfield Screenwriting Fellowship. Um, and to apply for it, you could send in any form of writing. And because I'd never written a screenplay before, I sent in my novel. And I got it. And so then I went to LA for a year. And I had a screenwriting mentor and a producing mentor at Paramount. And um, that's how I started to write screenplays. Great. So. Chris. Well, first, it's great to be back. And when I was at Georgetown, I would never, ever have dreamt that I was going to end up as a novelist, <laughs> you know, ever. I was at the School of Foreign Service studying economics, doing my best to get through. And you know, I'm, you know, I, I've written 10 books, and I'm either proud or ashamed to say <laughs> I never took one English class in college. <laughs> you know, it just, but I love reading. I love reading. <laughs> and uh, you know, I did everything else in college. And I had gone through the, you know, the, the gamut. I, I left college, I was a stockbroker, it was terrible. Um, I said the only D I ever got in college was in financial and securities markets. <laughs> so my first job was stockbroker, <laughs> right? So, so that didn't end well, but I got serious and I went to business school. And then I, you know, this is 1988, and I remember going to see that movie Wall Street. Oh, wow. and, and I thought Gordon Gekko was the hero. <laughs> so you know, I said, I'm gonna go work in M&A. So I worked in, in, in Switzerland for, for seven years in investment banking, and then I ran a watch company. And then one day I was like 32, and I said, you know, I'm not happy. You know, I don't wanna live in a, in a building just doing business and calculating numbers and this and that. And I had just gotten married, and I said, you know, I, I have a change of, of plan in mind. And, and my wife at the time said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to write novels. And she said, well, have you ever written a story? <laughs> I said, no. She goes, well, do you actually have a, like a novel hidden in that top drawer? <laughs> I said, no, but I think I could do it. And, and she looked at me and she says, you know, I think you could do it too. And that was nice. And so I quit. <laughs> and Cold Blue just decided I want to be a novelist. And, you know, with the tip of the hat to Georgetown, I think honestly that it's like the stuff you come to a school like this for that gives you the confidence that you could do anything. And then a year or two years later, that book came out and you know, I got it published. First book, got an agent, got it published, and I was launched. Excellent. So Lindsay started to answer this question before. When they, whoever they are, say, write what you know, um, you obviously knew a lot about banking, Chris, and you knew a great deal about architecture, and you did a lot of research. And Mark, you always wanted to write. So what did you know that led you to write? I didn't always want to write. write at you all. didn't always want no. to write. Uh, I did pre-med here, uh. and then um, <laughs> I worked in the hospital. And so, I, like for sophomore, junior, and senior years, I worked in the hospital in gastroenterology. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, wow. <laughs> Uh, and, and I knew, I, I, I kind of knew by junior year that the med school thing wasn't going to happen. So I just, I kind of went to the English department by default. Um, and I took a bunch of English courses my junior and senior year and managed to get a degree in, in English. Um, but I never wanted to write. I never thought I was going to write. I thought I was going to be a, a high school English teacher. And so I went to Stanford to learn to be an, a high school English teacher. And while I was there, I took a creative writing class mainly to sort of see how creative writing was taught. And I just really liked it. And my professors were really encouraging. And uh, that's when I started writing fiction. But I have to go back a little bit. In at my senior year at Georgetown, I took a class called American Lit of the 60s. And um, it was taught like a literature course would have been taught in the 60s. So like the, the assignments were very sort of free form. Like I did a big painting of Sylvia Plath. And like, like um, <laughs> but you could sort of turn in like creative responses to things. And that's when I sort of first started writing creatively. And that professor was very, was very encouraging as well. But I, I still, it was still like in the back of my mind, like I never, like, I never thought I would be a writer. Me neither. I, yeah. The magazine, magazine industry was not even on my radar. In my, in my class at Georgetown, I think it was the late 80s, and just about 90% of my peers were going to Citibank or um, Chase 
training programs. I went to a law firm on Park Avenue for pre-law, because that's what I was supposed to do. And uh, really, the only thing I knew about architecture was through building Legos and subscribing <laughs> since childhood to Architectural Digest, literally. <laughs> um, so, but I lasted all of three months when I was at Proskauer, but the, the good thing is that while I was at Georgetown, I also, I interned on Capitol Hill, I interned at Sotheby's uh, here in Georgetown, and I worked at the National Gallery of Art. So I had exposure to, really, to global art and politics, and that gave me such well-rounded exposure and helped me, that helped me kind of channel my interests a little bit more, and I was able to kind of go back to the artistic side to my creative side and tap into that. And I was interviewing Stern for an article. Um, I got a job at a very embarrassing small title that I won't even put on my resume. Um, <laughs> it, was later, it was later bought by a uh, pornographer who was, trying to just, who was trying to actually validate their portfolio in some way. So. <laughs> and I will add that one of the top editors uh, at Elle magazine, uh, she and I worked together. So we, we got good exposure. I guess. <laughs> Pun intended. So to speak. <laughs> um, so let me ask all of you how much you consider your audience when you write. You had a different experience, but you had to consider the audience when you were doing architectural writing and Southern living. And you, as novelists and screenwriters, have also had to consider your audience. Does it affect what you're writing, or do you just write what you want to do and audience forget about them? Oh, stump well, I'll the go panel. ahead. It's easy for me. I mean, I write, I write commercial fiction. I write, try to write best-selling fiction. And uh, you write, you definitely do not write what you just want to write. You are writing according to a very strict formula, uh, which is fun. I mean, I write the books that I love to read. I mean, I grew up reading the classics. You know, Robert Ludlum, John Grisham, and Tom Clancy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's what I like to write. And so for me, when I go to work, I write the stories that I love to read as a kid. And, but you, have to, you just have to follow those rules. And uh, you know, someone early asked me earlier, does it get easier to write these books? You know, which are, I write these big globe-trotting, you know, bomb-ticking, loyalty-blurring thrillers. <laughs> that was from the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I have to follow that all the time. And, and it's fun, but the best you do learn as you go on, you know, less adverbs, less adjectives, just streamline, streamline. So each book is harder to write. But hopefully, you know, you're delivering the same product. Mm -hmm. Mark? Um, I, I don't write like that. Um, but I kind of wish I could. Um, <laughs> but I can't. I, I write, uh, in terms of fiction, I always sort of think about my friends. You know, like, would they think this is interesting, compelling, funny? Um, and it's worked out pretty well in terms of like literary fiction that, you know, six people buy. Um, <laughs> all of whom are in my mother's book group. Um, uh, uh, but in terms of screenplays, you know, you have to sort of think of a bigger audience because, you know, no one's going to invest $7 million in your esoteric little whim. Um, so I... I definitely think about my audience more with screenplays. And, and you know, if I'm hired by a studio to, to write something, obviously it's different than you know, something I'm writing on spec that I try to sell later, which is mainly what I've kind of like fallen into because I, I just can't stand the, the studio stuff anymore. <laughs> it was good for a while. Mm -hmm. I worked for many magazine brands, and each one of them had very particular audiences with very particular uh, needs and, and demographics. And so I always, at Southern Living, for those of you who are not familiar with Southern Living, it's, it's a beloved, iconic brand launched in the, in the 1960s. And the challenge there was always to, I always had to write for that Southern woman who is incredibly proud of her heritage, but also think ahead to when the magazine was going to be on the newsstand to what was in her mind if it was the Thanksgiving holiday, what challenges were, was she facing over the Thanksgiving holidays? What stresses would be in her life? What problems could I help her solve? How can I make her feel better about who she is and what she's doing? And, you know, I would usually just kind of start with a theme and, and, and let it flow from the heart, speaking directly to her. 
and found that that worked best. I never was the kind of editor who wanted to just summarize what's in the issue, because I think that's rather boring. So I always tried to take that letter and uh, really infuse it with my own authentic self, but through the lens of what, of her life and her needs. And so that, that applied to every brand that I ever worked for in media. You know, that's very similar to writing a novel when you have different characters, when you have to put yourself in the places where people like, I don't know anything about a lady in the South that wants to, you know, make a specially good turkey or pumpkin soup or something, but you have to put yourself in that place, and that's the fun of our job. It's like, yeah. I never thought I'd be there, but gosh, you sit there, I always say, it's amazing what you don't think of when you stare at a white wall for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> and so there you go. So Lindsay a answered this before because he had to do a great deal of research and fact checking for what he did. If you don't know about making a Thanksgiving turkey and pumpkin soup, how much research do you have to do to write the novels, to write what you know? Well, yeah. To, you read for, recipes? for a recipe, I could look online. <laughs> and these days, that's, that's actually the sad part is you can find out so much online. It's all their pictures, videos, everything. But for me, my great joy in writing is the two or three months a year I have where I can go around the world and like research whatever story I'm doing and get out there and you know pretend I'm some type of investigative journalist or something. You know, the hard part is when you come back and you open your door and you look at that desk and say, oh my god, I'm going to be there for the next nine months. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh. Right, that's how you earn your living. But research is just is so fun. And as a writer, when you, if you tell people that you want to interview them, they will talk to you. The one quick anecdote I have is I was going to, to interview uh, a, a very high-ranking official at the FBI. He was actually the number two guy there. And to get in there, they make you jump through so many hoops and check you and this and that. And I finally got there and they go, Chris, come on in. He goes, Deputy Director, I won't say his name, has 30 minutes for you and that's it. I remember I walked in, he goes, oh, nice to see you. And we have like a pin and a pen for you, sit down. I go, what would you like to, he goes, what would you like to talk about? I said, well, I, I want to hear about your career. He looks at me, he goes, the whole thing? I go, yeah, he goes, well, you know, I started as a cop in Indianapolis. I go, let's start from the beginning. And he looks at his assistant, his assistant and he says, cancel all my meetings for the day. <laughs> <laughs> and we were there till six o'clock, so wow. it was funny. Well, that's People exciting. like to talk about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark, do you do similar traveling and... Research I have. In yeah, I, I wrote a, a collection of short stories about um, sort of weird cottage industries like worm farming and button making <laughs> and and those sort of things. And so I did a lot of and I did a lot of research for that, both like traveling to uh, this part of Iowa on the Mississippi where buttons are made from the freshwater uh, clams and. Uh, just stuff like that. I think like going to the places is really important because you will notice sort of details that you can't sort of see online. Um, um, I do a lot of reading and observing. You know, I, I'm the one on the subway who like misses his stop because he's fascinated by these two teenage girls. <laughs> you know, talking about you know where they're going to score some meth. Or whatever. Um, no, they're not talking about that. But you know what I mean. That is research. Yeah, I, I do. I do a lot of observing of people. And you've all said to me before we came here that you all read voraciously. So, what authors have influenced you in your writing? Or is that a tough question to answer? If anybody. Well, you already said what Tom Clancy and <laughs> the class. Robert exactly. Ludlow. Exactly. <laughs> Walker Percy, The Last Walker Gentleman. Walker Percy. I was thinking about The Last Gentleman in particular because there, there's a journey from New York down to the South. Uh, and <laughs> there are many situations that parallel my own, but he actually, the city, uh, he, I think he goes, travels to Mississippi, but the description of the book was actually, he was actually living in Birmingham and I lived in the neighborhood that he describes in the book. And there was something so vivid and so clear about all of that writing, and it just, it was very influential to me, that, that book in particular. Um, but I read a lot of, of course, Southern authors, and you know, the, the, the ones that particularly evoke the landscape and the, and the mood of the region, because I had to, as a way of fully, fully immersing myself in the brand and, and where the brand came from. And Mark? 
Um, I really admire short story writers, and I think part of why I do is that when I first started taking creative writing classes, we were reading contemporary short fiction, and I, I just found it so fun. And because I didn't, you don't, as an English major, you don't necessarily read much contemporary stuff. And so to know that literature was still sort of alive and happening was great. And I, and I, you know, there are contemporary writers who I really admire. Like there's this guy Rick Bass who I love. Um, there's uh, George Saunders, Laurie Moore, um, Alice Munro I love, um, and Annie Proulx. Who, who are the best short story writers now? I would say Alice Munro, mm -hmm. whose mm. whose story I adapted for a film last year, um, and she won the Nobel Prize last year. Um, she's this old Canadian woman who writes amazing short stories. Um, uh, I, th I would say she's sort of the best living short story writer, is Alice Monroe. What story did you adapt for a screenplay? That's pretty impressive. Hate ship, love sh hate ship, friendship, courtship, love ship, marriage, which got truncated to hate ship, love ship. Um, but anyway, I, I mean. Did she help you? No, she, she didn't. She hindered. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, she, she didn't want to be involved, but um, she sent some uh, emissaries to the. Toronto Film Festival when, when it first screened. Wow. And they reported back to her that it was okay. So this will be a question <laughs> primarily for the fiction writers. Um, what, do you know how the story or novel is going to end before you writing it? Or do you sort of make it up as you go along? <laughs> That's the funniest question for me because I write thrillers. And it always ends with an explosion somewhere, so. <laughs> you better know where that explosion is or else you can't get there. And that's the best question because I think for all fiction, if you, a book is always better, always, if you know how it's gonna end. And there's some strange novelists that like start the ending and deconstruct it backwards at the beginning. All I know is, for me, I know what, how it's gonna start and who it's about. And then I have to know where it's gonna go. Otherwise, you know, you can't write a book in a year. You know, five years later, you're, you're halfway over here and here, and you, you can't get to the ending. So, you know, it's a question of organization and discipline. And you know, writing is about discipline. It, it really is. And uh, you know, I, it's an art, I guess. I look at it as a business that I just the one thing, thank God, in the world that I'm good at because I'm not good at anything else. You know, to earn a decent living. That's true. I was a horrible investment banker. And uh, I have a funny story. I worked in Zurich for UBS and I wanted to work, like I said, like that story, I wasn't kidding about Gordon Gecko, And uh, you know, I worked in M&A in, 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 at UBS in Zurich and right away they go, do not let Chris Reich try to analyze the numbers for this company. But you get to write the book. So in M&A you write these big deal memos like 500 pages long. So I wrote one and one day I got a call from the head of the Swiss bank, Robert Holzak. And at UBS to be head of a Swiss bank it's like being a minor potentate of a country, okay? <laughs> These people are serious. And this man, Robert Holstack, the last time he smiled, dinosaurs were roaming the earth. <laughs> you know, and I walked in there, and this little guy goes, Herr Reich, willkommen. <laughs> and I walked into his room, and he took me, and he grabbed me. He goes, I just read your last deal memo. He goes, it was very funny. Yeah. <laughs> and I go, I didn't really think once. He goes, he goes, you're our own Michael Crichton. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> in, for authors, we are, most of us have such delicate kind of egos and stuff. I will never forget that this 65-year-old man believed in me, and it was like awesome. So I was like, if he thinks so, maybe I should quit and give it a shot. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Mark? I, I often don't know where things are going to end. I'm, I know where screenplays are going to end, but my fiction, I don't. And that's why I don't sell millions and millions of copies. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I... You know, I start with character, and that's it. And I feel like the plot unravels with the character. Um, and I, I, I sort of will know a protagonist for several months before I start sitting at my computer and writing about him or her. Um, I'm thinking about them a lot. Um, and then the plot just sort of happens. And, you know, my books aren't plot heavy. Um, they're not, but they are character heavy. Um, and I mean, that's probably 
my films are that way too. <laughs> they're not plot heavy, they're character heavy. So let me ask the two of you a question, and I have a separate question for Lindsay. Books into film. What's it like to write screenplays? Do you, you've done your own, you've done others. You've seen some of your books turned into film. Is that an artistic genre that resonates with how you wrote your book in the first place, or do you have to give it up to let somebody else take the creative role? Um, the adaptation I wrote of my novel, Goats, was like a huge disappointment. Like the production part of it was a huge disappointment. And it was like a double bummer because it was <laughs> my novel, my baby, and then like my other baby, the script that I wrote based on my novel, and then to hand it over to a bunch of cretins um, <laughs> was really tough. <laughs> And, or to sort of learn that they were Cretans um, <laughs> was really tough. Um, and that was a bummer. But, you know, like other, I, I, can't, I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> like, like, the artistic end oh. of a film okay, as so, opposed to the novel. Okay, so then the, the adaptation I wrote of the Alice Munro short story, that one I was, you know, I love Alice Munro, as I said, and so to be able to adapt one of her short stories was just a crazy, gift from the sky, you know? Um, and I really wanted, to, the, the studio at the time, Warner Brothers, you know, paid me to write it, and they said it has to be contemporary, it can't be set in 1938, where the story was. They said this, this, and this. There were some parameters, but I really wanted to preserve the tone of her short story and the character, the, her protagonist. And that's what I worked really hard to do. And luckily, I didn't have to turn it over to a bunch of Cretans. And I actually liked the film. So, Well, I have, I have some experience doing this because like everybody else who grew up in Los Angeles, I'm a Holly wannabe. And so about four years ago, one of my books, my first book, Number to Count, there was this big convention, International Thriller Writers, and they had some panel that I was not on. But they had this list of the 10 best thrillers never to be made into a movie. And an author, Lorenzo Carcaterra, who wrote a couple books and a couple movies, said my favorite one that wasn't adapted was Number to Count. So my phone went off the hook the next day with the producer saying we want to make Number to Count. And so I had a friend of mine, his name is Yanni Sigvatson. He was one of the founders of MTV, and he's produced, a, he did all David Lynch's movies, very prolific. He goes, he's from Iceland. He goes, Chris, this is Yanni. He goes, we must make a Number to Count into a movie. So I started working with this guy, and he goes, first thing he goes, I love the book. He goes, but he goes, we need a chase scene in the first 10 pages, nudity in the first 20, you know, and go from there. He goes, otherwise it's perfect. Anyway, so I wrote and, and readapted that thing 50 times. We ended up getting a director from Iceland. The hot director du jour came down, you know, said, we're going to make, you know, this is going to be a hell of a picture. Jake Gyllenhaal signs on. Then the director decides he wants to go back to Iceland. Financing falls out. It, it's so frustrating. It is just, it is, it's a horrible business populated by liars. I mean, just, no, no, it, I'm not kidding. It is, they're just the worst people. Good luck. I mean, I don't know one, I, could, I can name on two fingers like the real honorable, nice people. You know, dishonesty is the currency in Hollywood. Yeah. And not just to be negative, just the way it is. And so if you wonder, that's why people ask, why are there so many bad movies? It's because the bad movies people. that get made are made by producers that won't say no and they just ram it down their throat, and they never give up. And that's why there's very few movies, probably like your movie, which I'm sure is excellent, you know, the uh, Alice Monroe movie, that adults like to go see. And it's hard, so it's a frustrating process, to say the least. So a different question for Lindsay. You've written, you've edited, and now you've just become the chancellor for the North Carolina School for the Arts. Congratulations. Thank you. You have some wonderful predecessors. What has your writing and editing career done to prepare you for this new step with other creative artists and to deal with the arts in a very different way? Oh my goodness, more than I ever imagined, honestly. I mean, I've had to, there are weeks where I am at the podium five days in a week, and I have very little time to prepare remarks in between, but I will be talking to five completely different audiences who want to hear very different things from me, and each one of them is, 
you've got the faculty, you've got potential donors, you've got the Rotary Club, I have the, the, the UNC Board of Governors, there was a, a community day where the mayor comes and speaks before me. So, you know, it's, it's, I have to just keep switching constantly between all these different audiences, and it's the magazine editor in me that allows me to do that. You know, okay, what's inside their head? What is it that they, what is, what is it that they, ex, that they're expecting me to communicate? Not that I'm just saying what they want to hear, but I am trying to sort of adjust the messaging um, to make it relevant to that audience. And that's what I've done for 18 years at Time Inc. <laughs> so you've answered, all three of you, a lot of questions from me. I'm going to ask you a last question and then turn it over to our excellent audience, who I hope will have a number of questions for you. Because if you don't, I still have more. So. Here's the last question for each of you. Maybe Chris has started to answer this, talking about the movie scene. But what's the hardest part of being a writer and being a writer in the various aspects of your profession? And what advice would you give to the aspiring writers in our audience now? Stay away from movie producers in LA. I think we got that one. That, that is true. No, the hardest part, I think, is just having the discipline to, to, to write a book, or just to write in general. You know, everyone has one book in them, fair enough. It's harder when you have to have the second, third, fourth book in you. And so it's just, a, it's just a, the requirement is just to be able to, you know, Mark Twain's first rule of writing, apply back of pants to seat of chair, you know? <laughs> and that's what it takes. You just have to be able to sit down and, you know, the muse never comes to you. There's no muse that dances on your shoulder and gives you all these ideas. The muse comes maybe after five hours of sitting there with your pen. I still write longhand, sorry. You know, it, it comes to you. So, uh, but having said that, I love writing. I don't find it a hard profession. I mean, every, all of us have hard professions. You know, I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, this is a special thing. It's no different than being a doctor who, how does he feel after his seventh patient during the day? Or uh, being, you know, any, an investment banker or this and that. It's just a profession. You know, I can do it, I try to do as well as I can. So I think the hardest thing is just trying to apply yourself and to be diligent and to give the best of yourself. Uh, I too, like, I, I, I feel really fortunate that I get to sit at my computer and make up stories and make a living of doing that. Um, but I, I think that rejection is really hard, um, and it doesn't get any easier. Um, and uh, like just today, we had the, the the lead actor in a film drop off. Like literally today, we got the email from him, and it's just such a bummer. You know, you work like four months trying to get this guy to say yes. He says yes, and then he bails. Anyway. Um, but and, you know, rejection from an actor, rejection from uh, a financing company for film, and then even like in fiction, you know, I I still publish short fiction, um, and luckily now I have an agent to mail my stories out to magazines. But like sometimes I'll mail stories out myself, and I'll get like a rejection from like you know, the lost acorn review or something, like, you know, like, <laughs> that no one reads. And it's still, like, really, like, God, why am I a writer? I should have gone to medical school after all. Like, I should be a gastroenterologist. You know, like, like, why am I, you know, like, I suck. This editor at the lost acorn review doesn't like my story, you know. So you need, I think the hardest part is that, at least for me, is that I need that sort of like external affirmation because there's none in here. <laughs> I'll echo what Chris said. I think the discipline is the hardest thing of all to um, really to maintain because to be an art, I mean, to be, writers are artists and now that I'm running a conservatory, I feel it more than ever. It, you have to cultivate the discipline of getting into a state of what all a state of flow, say. I mean, even if you meditate or you practice yoga you, and you lose yourself in it, it's the same process. It's essentially sort of turning over your digital-minded brain, which is used to Instagramming and Facebooking and 
taking selfies and texting your friends a thousand times a day and checking 500 emails. You have to really separate yourself from the world uh, in a very deliberate way in order to get into that state of flow and to avoid the kinds of distractions that all of us have today. That's what creates great art. And what I see in writers and the, the students that I work with now is that they're very, they are cultivating very deep forms of perception and that only the arts can create. And so I think that anybody who wants to be a writer has to work really hard to cultivate that. And you can, you can do that through all kinds of things. I mean, if, even if you looked at Betty Edwards' book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, and you just, I remember when I got into, before I got into architecture school, I, the first time I ever did a drawing is I drew my left hand. And I, from there, I sort of understood the artistic process. And I would, I would highly recommend the book to anybody because I think it would benefit any, anybody who wants to be a writer or an artist of any kind to get into that state of flow. Fascinating. There's this one funny comment. You know, the author Jonathan Franzen, this is exactly apropos of like this digital age which ruins everything. I'm kind of going through an anti-internet thing because I'm so addicted to it. And as a writer, you have to get into this space, you know. And Jonathan Franzen, he wrote that in a funny article in Time Magazine, the cover story, he said first, you know, he worked in his house, then he put his office in a separate house, and finally he took his computer and put crazy glue inside the internet connection <laughs> <laughs> so he could never get it online. And I'm just the same way. So I'm, I, I rip my internet cord out, then I put it back in, take it back out, and I'm going to look for some crazy glue on Monday. <laughs> I have a friend who's a writer, and she's the same way. And she actually has a program that will only allow her to be on the internet mm. for 15 minutes a day. That's a great wow. program. And I want that. And it, possible. And, um, and you can set it, you know, like, all right, I can be on the internet for 45 minutes or whatever. But I, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. OK, so open to questions from the audience. Please come to one of the microphones and direct your question to any or all of our esteemed panel. Hi. So internet cynicism aside, um, it's pretty clear that there's been an increase in digital publishing. Um, most publications have some form online now. So where do you guys see the future of publishing as a thing, um, traditional publishing? physical publishing, or do you think it's all going to be on the internet? At Time Inc., about, you know, I think it was 2010, we made a huge investment in our tablet editions. We launched five tablet editions, and which meant that people probably don't understand the process, but you have to take, for every print page that you see, there were probably a gazillion uh, tablet pages that our art department had to design, um, because one print page equals about 10 tablet pages as you're swiping through. And what we found, actually, um, it was huge investment, hugely time consuming, just a big suck on everybody's time and labor and resources, but we thought, okay, it's coming. It's gonna kill the print edition. But what we discovered, and what I had sort of thought all along, is that actually print is a lean back experience, digital is a lean forward experience, and it's a different mindset. And I think that that lean, leaning back experience is, always going to be with us. I think that ideally, and what we discovered through our research is that people just want both. They want to be able to have the convenience of looking up a recipe on their tablet or having it in the kitchen, but it would actually enhance their likely, their, the likelihood that they would renew their subscription if they could have the tablet and the print edition both. I feel strongly that print media will be around for a long time. It's not consumers that are driving uh, the decline of print media, it's advertisers who are chasing the, the, the shiny object du jour, which is not working. You know, I'll say one more thing, but a media, an ad media executive, um, a good friend of mine, came home one day and he had been talking about, you know, what digital ad campaign that they were going to do to capture people's attention, what buzzy, crazy thing were they going to do, and he came home and he saw his wife reading, reading Southern Living and he called out to her and she didn't answer and he said, honey, she, yeah. And, she, and he realized that she was so absorbed in the, in the magazine that there was no better way to capture somebody's attention than through print advertising. And so I always thought, duh, okay, now. Um, it, it, so 
I don't know if advertisers will actually believe that or not before it's too late, but I, I believe in print media, and I'm sure you guys have. I mean, I'm a, I, mean I wish people were reading more books. And used to, used to take, I used to have some friends in Connecticut, and they'd come into Wall Street, and you'd look on the train, and everyone in the morning was reading a paperback. You know, I don't know if you know, paperback sales have completely collapsed of books. They're down 50% in 10 years or 60%. People just don't read paperbacks. On the other hand, my 85-year-old mother has like 50 books stored up on her Kindle, and she doesn't stop. She literally finishes one and starts the next one. It's like, Mom, don't you want to like absorb what you just read? She goes, no, I'm just going to go to the next one, you know. She still calls David Baldacci, David Balducci. She's read every one of his <laughs> books. She will not get it right. But uh, you know, the world is changing. We have to change with it. I think it's weird that my students like have had the internet and email their whole lives. And I'm wondering if, like, I loved what you said because I hate reading anything on a tablet or on my computer or whatever. Like, I, I just, I don't like it. Um, and I love books, I love the way they smell. But I'm wondering if, like, you know, the young woman who asked the question, who probably had email when she was two, um, <laughs> and the internet, like, I'm wondering if they are, you know, if they're gonna, I don't know. The, the majority of millennials prefer, this is research says, the majority of millennials prefer to read books in print than they do. Good, yeah. But a lot of, but it, it's, <laughs> but a lot of the changes, uh, it's, it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy because it does come from industry. Not, it, it's not driven by the consumer, it's driven by the industry and by advertisers. That's my humble opinion. I like that. So as a librarian, I just have to say, the cover of this week's New Yorker is stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of books. And I actually think of a book as an acronym, B-O-O-K, the body of organized knowledge. Wow. Long may it live. Yay. <laughs> Bravo for that. Good question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, um, my name is Jim Ross, I'm an alum from the class of 69, and I've noticed lately that a lot of my peers have gotten to the point of saying, now I want to write, as they're ending whatever they were doing before. And I've been on that track for a couple of years, and I want to become the George Saunders of creative nonfiction, so I can't write anything long. Um, the, the, the dilemma I've encountered is I spent a career writing proposals to get funding for the federal government to do research. and was very good at that. I knew that half of getting funded was what you wrote and half of it was making connections. Well, I don't have any connections and the only thing I, I'm happy with getting published was so, something where I walked up to, I knew someone was gonna be somewhere and I walked up to her and I said, can you read this? And she said, okay, so that got published. How do, you, how do you do this? Um, what I found, my, my strategy has been to try to get things published in literary journals, most of which are based in MFA programs at universities, nearly all of which are run by 23-year-olds. And, and in, in May, they go home, and the next year's editors come in, come back in in September and whatever was left on the desk or wherever on the computer, they look at it in the fall, it's like, what is this? So there's you're no asking? Con there's, no, there's no continuity, and you're, 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 you're trying to please 23-year-olds. Is there another strategy to, uh, fig to, to, to trying to, I mean, this is a big phenomenon, and, and probably 50 people in this audience so wanted to I ask the same pardon. question. I need to ask you, yes, if I've you're asked asking, question. what's the strategy to get published? What is the strategy? A lot of people are interested in this transition, I'm, and it doesn't have to be creative nonfiction, but it is dealing, how do you make the transition? How do you establish credibility? How do you? I would, I, I would the short answer would be, is to, for me, is know your audience. You have to be really crystal clear about who it is you're trying to reach, and how it is that you're gonna to relate to them. Mm -hmm. How is whatever it is that you're writing about meaningful or relevant or interesting to that particular audience? And you have to be really clear about that audience and you, have to, you can't dilute it. You have to study them, know them. I mean, 
I did the garden club circuit at Southern Living to right. get to know those women in the small rural counties of the South. Mm -hmm. And that's how I knew who I was talking to, face to face, focus grouping, Great. you know, the mothers and the daughters exactly. of the South. So I would say, know your audience. I, I would say too that like what you're doing is what George Saunders did, you know? He started in the Lost Acorn Review. Mm -hmm. He didn't immediately get published in Harper's or whatever. He, he started that way. And I didn't know it was a real thing. <laughs> no, <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> I just made it up. I just made it up. Okay. But I mean, there are, there are literary journals that are, you right. know, that kind of obscure or whatever. Right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I think one thing that you, sh that, that I, one little bit of advice I would give you is, is maybe go to like some conferences because then you're going to like meet like-minded people and even if they can't help you get published in the Lost Acorn Review, at least like you'll have sort of comrades. And I think that that's the best thing that I got out of mm -hmm. the writing programs I did were my friends and my, you know, my cohort. Um, it wasn't connections and it wasn't like any amazing relationship with professors. Um, it was the people who I, you know, who I came up with as 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 writers, and yeah, that, that's what I would say to you, mm -hmm. like as someone in your I'll position. It, yeah. And it looks like Chris agrees. I agree. Hi, um, thank you for coming. Um, this question is mainly for Lindsay, but you, you, it might apply to you guys too. So um, you have to write a lot of articles, um, and. Um, and you, 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 you just said that you had to sort of get into the mind of sort of your reader. Um, so I was wondering, was there ever a time when like sort of, how do you know whether your articles do speak to your readers? Have you ever sort of written, written something that has turned out to be striking the wrong tone? And if so, how would you know that? Um, and then maybe for the other two, um, you have a little bit less sort of um, opportunity for feedback, but was there ever someone who sort of um, gave you a different perspective on how you how you wrote and that made you change like something for your next story or book? The reader mail, managing the reader mail uh, for a brand, it was a full time job for somebody, um, so I knew uh, <laughs> when how depending on how the mail was trending. So um, I it, there was a lot of uh, if I said something unknowingly to make people angry, I mean, it was, it would show up in my email or, so I had that immediate feedback. And, and I think that applies to any writer whose name and email address is out there. People are not shy about speaking up. How do, how do you let that sort of affect the rest of your writing? Sorry. It, uh, I, it, was, it was funny. I always kind of liked to do a sort of reader report um, for the whole staff on the advertising and marketing and editorial teams because certain themes kept coming up over and over again. And so that would actually help inform what I was going to be writing about or thinking about what problems could I help her solve. And so I, would, I, I used that as a way of saying, okay, well, this month um, I'm getting a lot, I can't think of a specific example of, uh, it's, it, maybe let's say it's some hard to find ingredient, let's say. It was, Great, thank you. Sure. Next question. Yeah, hi, this is another uh, getting started question. Um, so where I'm at, I got a regular nine to five job. It's a good one, but uh, you know, I think I got the guts to you know, someday break out, try to become a writer. I've got the discipline, I've got the creativity, and I live in this incredibly naive bubble where I tell myself those things plus antisocial weekends at the coffee shop, <laughs> you know, eventually I'll get there and that's, you know, voila, success. Here's my stack of handwritten notes. Um, I know nothing about editors, publishers, agents, what's that? Um, I heard you guys say go to conferences. You know, further advice, what are the do's and don'ts? How do I market myself, protect myself, make a living, that kind what of thing? What do you want to write? Science fiction. That's obviously Game of Thrones, good category, right? Kind of like that. I know, you know, when I wrote, I'd never written anything, but I wasn't fooling myself. I wanted to make a living at this, and I wanted to be successful. And I sat down, and I picked my three favorite books. At the time it was, Key to Rebecca, The Eye of the Needle, both by Ken Follett, and The Night Manager by John le Carre. And I said, I'm gonna write a book like these. I'm not better than them. I don't have the newest idea. I'm gonna learn, they're gonna teach me how to write a novel, okay? So if you wanna write science fiction, please follow my advice. Pick your three favorite books 
and write it like them. And don't do better and don't say, I'm more imaginative, you know. <laughs> Tell a good story. Shakespeare said the plot's the thing, but find a, and make sure those books are bestsellers. <laughs> okay. Of course. <laughs> and then do it. And then you have a chance. And so once I have like advice. that manuscript written, like, where do I, how do I find a publisher and editor and all that kind so of thing? So maybe, maybe you could ask that question offline afterward because sure, we've I'll got a few more people sure. wanting to ask. Please. Thank you for coming in. This is very useful for me to listen to you um, talk about your different um, professions, especially I'm an English and film major here, so I want to write for the screen. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, this is more to, um, to uh, Mark and Chris, um, what are the pros and cons of writing for major film studios and what are the limitations that are imposed on you and um, how would you recommend uh, I go into the industry if I want to avoid those bad guys from Hollywood that you were talking about? Um, I say the pros of working for a studio or writing for a studio is that you get paid a lot of money <laughs> and that's it. Um, and, and, um, and then, you know, I, I, I much prefer to just write scripts that I like and hopefully someday they'll be sold and made into films. Um, but, you know, it's also a luxury, right? Like, I, not everyone has the luxury of just writing scripts that they want to write and... You know, the only way to make it in Hollywood is you have to first start writing your own scripts, okay? There's something called the blacklist. That's a list. You probably know what that is. It's like the 50 best screenplays every year that aren't produced. And so if you want to be a screenwriter, which I think is a crazy way to try to make a living to go in, uh, the odds are so stacked against you. And, uh, and the people that are judging you, like you were saying, are not always worthy of judging you. Um, but you have to have, write a great script on your own, okay? So... I write novels. You got to write a great screenplay, which is just as hard as writing a great novel because, you know, everything in the screenplay, I could write 600 pages to tell a great story in a novel. You have to do it in 120 pages, you know, one page a minute in the screenplay. And so you have to write something that will get the attention of an agent. And then you have to get an agent at CAA, UTA, ICM, or, or William Morris. ICM's gone, I guess, kind of. So one of the top three. And that's the only way you're going to get in. And they're going to love you, they're going to champion you. And then, Either, even if you don't make that screenplay, they'll say it's so good that they'll get you work rewriting or writing something for the Weinstein Company where they'll pay you like 20,000 bucks and just abuse the heck out of you. And then maybe you'll get to the next step and the next step. I think one thing that you said that is, is interesting is like um, that blacklist is usually, you know, it's usually spec script. It is always spec scripts and it's always sort of new writers. It's normally new writers. But I think that everything, like I think the screenplays that get noticed are the ones that actually have a voice, like a new voice. Even if they're never made, you're, you know, you use that as a writing sample to get all of those jobs. That's what happened to me. I mean, my first script was made, but I got a lot of attention just because it was, uh, it was a different voice. It obviously know? was excellent, so that's what you have to <laughs> cut through. <laughs> Quality shines through. As a writer, my agent says, every day all I want to see is something good and new. I'm sure you know, you're looking for a good writer. My agent says he can tell within two pages if someone can write, within five if they have a story to tell. For so you have to be good. You have to be good. And then among the good, then the, then the culling starts taking place. I think that you know, as far as like what you should do to get started, I wouldn't move to LA and answer the phone. Hmm. Like, I think if you really want to write and make films, um, move back home with your parents in Connecticut or wherever you're from and, and, and write from there. Like I, like, I really think like being in LA is kind of caustic. Um, if, if you want to be a writer, if you want to be a producer, yes, you should be answering the phone. Yeah. You should be the answering the phone for a producer and you should be reading scripts for a producer. If you want to be a writer, don't do that. It's better that you're like, you know, a barista at Starbucks in Connecticut than answering the phone at UTA. I think if you want to be a writer. Again, though, if you want to be a producer, then you should be answering the phone and you should be learning about all that stuff. Okay. 
Interesting. And never advice. give up. I'm actually never give I'm up. from Brazil, not Connecticut. Okay. Long way. <laughs> <laughs> Another question over here. We have Hi. room for three more questions. Hi, um, I'm a master's in journalism student at this university, and I have, uh, I mean, I do have a creative writing side, but so this question is applicable to all three, but mainly for Lindsay. Um, when you start out writing, I already have published clips, but, um, but I haven't got into the paid part of the, my career. Mm -hmm. um, so wh how, how do you make a living out of writing, out of the writing profession? <laughs> In 25 words or less, All there right. you go. <laughs> how do you make a living out of writing? Wow, okay. It, um, you, you do have to, I'm, it's, glad, it's great that you have uh, some clips that have been published. I mean, when we were hiring, I mean, we would always look for, the, for that base of experience, and I would read literally the first sentence or two, maybe, of somebody's clips to kind of make that snap judgment. Sounds harsh, but it, it, it was a way to sort of, there was the volume of what we would receive was just overwhelming. So we had to make those snap decisions. And it is true, freelance budgets have been cut, so it's harder to get paid now than it was back in the day. And what you have to do is, there's a couple of ways to get, there's a couple of ways to go at it. I mean, the traditional route is you build your basic clips, you finally build your credibility, and you, know, you get something that, you get an assignment from a, a title that has money to, to give to freelancers, and you can research that very easily. The other way is, would be to go the digital media route and look at bloggers who have a voice that's similar to yours, say, and look at how they've monetized what they're doing. Because there are a lot of people who, are, who have become really incredibly successful as one woman, one man operations, uh, and they have, Ariana Huffington, for example, uh, might be the most extreme example. Uh, but there's all kinds of ways to monetize content. That's not easy either, because there's so much competition there. Um, but it's, it's really through the tenaciousness and hard work, and there's no other secret to it, I'm afraid. Hi, um, my question is for anybody who wants to answer it, and that is, how did Georgetown prepare you, how did your Georgetown experience prepare you for what you do now? And um, in other words, what advice would you give to the students to optimize their Georgetown experience if this is the route they want to go? And how did the library help you? <laughs> well, I'll start. I'm, I'm, you know, I have a daughter about to go to college, and I am a huge believer in learning. And people aren't smart enough anymore. They're just not. They're not knowledgeable enough anymore, you know. And my fondest memories are being like on the fourth floor, fifth floor of a lounge or looking out over the leaves and just reading a book for like four hours at a time. Now, I'll wager that never happens anymore. No one sits for four hours at a time and reads a book because doot, doot, something's going off, you know. So, you know, I just love learning. I love art history. I love English. I love history. And the reason I could write the kind of books I have is because I learned so much here, you know? Good answer. Period. And, you know, I learned so much here, so, yeah. I, you know, I tell my students, like both my fiction writing students and my screenwriting students, like, you can learn as much about writing in a physics class or a, you know, it used to be called Euro Civ here. I don't know what it's called anymore. And Euro Civ or, or whatever, as you can in a writing class. And I think that like Georgetown, you get a broad liberal education here. And I can't think of a better preparation for a writer than that. Another um, good answer. And oh, one please, thing about please. the library. Um, I think better in the library, good. I learned, uh, I learned discipline you know I studied a lot when I was here I was a total bookworm like I you know I really really worked hard academically here and I think that that you know that's why I can work hard now I loved being at a global institution in a global city and I was 
very much immersed in the city itself when I was here, and I benefited so much from that. And I, my very first class at Georgetown was, I think, The Problem of God. <laughs> Is that still taught here? Oh, yes. I love it. Um, <laughs> and that was, I mean, that to me says it all. I mean, the joy of learning about the world's religions. My family, I'm, I'm a mutt. I am the product of a of an Arab and a Jew. My mother's from Beirut, and my father is of uh, Jewish descent. So long story there. But it was, it was absolutely, um, it was the greatest foundation that one could have just in terms of the, the immersion in, in that global culture. As for the library, I lived in Village A. Um, if you're facing the library, if you look over to the right, second floor, Village A, that corner <laughs> unit, and we used to peer down into the library and do hand signals and waving and distracting friends. Um, <laughs> but I lived in that room, because this was the days, can you imagine not having a cell phone or email or anything? We, there was a computer lab, you That's know. Great. Like, <laughs> love it. Excellent answers. You've done very, Georgetown 101 prepared you very, very well, and Library 101, too. Last question. Hi, I was really intrigued, Mark, by your process of creating characters even before the plot. And I just kind of want to know essentially where these people came from. You know, are you going out people watching? Are these people based on your friends and family? And like, how long are these people kind of bouncing around inside your head while you're, develop while you're developing them from 2D flat people into 3D figures? And like, right. how do you kind of create a plot around these people? Um, I think they come from all of the things that you said. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, none of my characters are based, you know, solely on someone I know. But a lot of them have traits of people I know and things I see. And the, the protagonist for my first film, Smart People, Lawrence Weatherhold, is just grouchy English professor, um, really depressed, a widower. He was living, like, honestly, I was going to write that as a novel. And I got to this screenwriting fellowship, and I, what am I going to write? I don't know. So I thought, all right. Well, someone said, why don't you just write that novel you were going to write as a screenplay? So that's what I did. So I'd been living with that protagonist for a long time. And where did he come from? I mean, he came from me. I'm grouchy and depressed. And uh, he came a little bit from my father, who's a professor. He's not an English professor, but he's grouchy and depressed. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's just all of the things that you said. But I think once you, once you sort of find that protagonist, at least for me, and I, I know people write in different ways, but at least for me, with both screenplays and novels and short stories, if I, once I feel like I really know that protagonist, that's when the plot just sort of reveals itself to me. Um, and that's when I, you know, when I know how that character will behave in any situation, that's when I'm ready to start writing. That was helpful. Thank you. Would you not agree with me that this was an excellent panel full of great ideas and great insights? And kudos to you all, kudos to Georgetown for teaching you all, and many, <laughs> many thank yous You're for welcome. coming back to Georgetown and sharing your insights with all of us. Please join me in <laughs>